Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is V. I am an experienced actuary working in a life insurance company in Canada. So I am a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and also a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. So to become an actuary, you usually need to be credited by an actuary organization. So the Society of Actuaries, the SOA, is the world largest actual organization. Uh, another popular organization is the Casualty Actual Society. Uh, this video is the second part where Chelsea and I compare the different aspects between the SOA and the CAS. Uh, so for part one, uh, we talk about uh, what made us choose the SOA versus CAS and the ed education system for both. Uh, so you can check out this video through the link here. Uh, and in this video, we will continue to discuss where the SOA and CAS member work uh, and live, the salaries, as well as all the consideration that can help you choose between the two. Hi everyone, it's my pleasure to partner with V on this topic. My name is Chelsea Adler and I am a fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society. I also have a YouTube channel and a blog called Inspiring Actuaries where I talk about all things actuaries and insurance. So where do people uh, with SOA membership work? Uh, so the SOA provides some statistics for the member in terms of the countries and the type of employment. So as of December 2020, 66% of the SOA membership are in the US, 16% are in Canada, and 18% are in other countries. Uh, so SOA members are employed in many industries, uh, so excluding the members who are retired or not listing that industry. 40% is in insurance, 33% uh, in consulting, 14% uh, in health, and the rest in academic, bank, government, regulatory, technology, and other. So insurance is still the industry that hires the most actuaries for both CAS and SOA side. Uh, and you can see that people with SOA will be working with different insurance products uh, than the people with CAS uh, membership. So SOA actuaries work with uh, life insurance, health insurance, retirement benefits, uh, like annuities product, uh, while CAS actually work with insurance products like uh, house, car, catastrophe, uh, or more. Within the United States, we see the majority of actuaries working in the Northeast or Midwest for both the CAS and the SOA. However, as remote opportunities increase and jobs no longer revolve around large metropolitan areas, I expect the dispersion of actuaries across the country will change over time. As V mentioned, the majority of jobs for both the CAS and the SOA are in insurance and consulting. However, it appears a much larger portion of SOA actuaries fall into the other slash unknown category, which suggests to me that SOA actuaries may have a wider range of employment opportunities given the specialized tracks and larger society. Although I do wonder if part of that includes reinsurance, since it's not specifically listed for the SOA. If that's the case, that could explain a large portion of the difference. To learn more about all the different locations and types of work actuaries do, check out my blog, Where Do Actuaries Work? Link below. In this post, I've interviewed actuaries all over the world in a variety of different companies and positions, including V. If you're curious how working in a traditional insurance environment compares to the tech world or starting your own company, check it out. So I'm sure you are on curious on whether SOA members or cast member make more money. Uh, so let's find out. The nice thing about the actual profession is that uh, information on salaries is quite public. There are many actual, uh, actuarial recruitment companies that do salary surveys and publish them on their website uh, so that aspiring as well as current actuaries are aware and that also keep the market rates competitive. So I will go through some stats uh, from the DW Simpson website and Chelsea will go through some more um, in detail from other sources. You can find uh, the salary surveys uh, from DW Simpson on the website and their survey um, focus more from, uh, on actuaries uh, or actual candidates still working in the U.S. Uh, and uh, they they have three main categories, uh, which are health, life, 
uh, in uh, FCAS, so the general insurance, uh, each separate from like a uh, fellow level, associate level, and then student level. So, and then they also have uh, other um, areas like uh, EA, LHP, exam pass, or PNC, uh, exam pass salary survey. And you can just click on each of uh, their uh, result uh, graph. And for each of that, they will show uh, base salary, bonus, as well as total compensation and how are different by the years of experiences. So it seems like they have more people submitted from the health, uh, SOA and the cash side uh, rather than the life side. Uh, by the number of uh, uh, data points that they actually have. And overall, uh, when you look at these, uh, you can uh, use these as uh, references uh, for your negotiation advantage. And uh, keep in mind about like the number of exams as well as the number of years of experiences that you have, as well as the, the roles and the level of the job that you apply to. One of my favorite resources to share when people ask how much actuaries make is the salary survey created by Ezra Penlin. I love these because they are broken down by type of actuarial work and it has a grid to show how much you make given the years of experience and number of exams passed. Focusing first on entry level positions, according to the study, actuaries and PNC roles tend to get paid more than those working in the life, health and pension space. You can see that for zero to one years of experience and two to three exams, PNC actuaries earn between 62 and 87,000, while the range for non-PNC jobs was about 55 to 75,000. Then looking at fully credentialed actuaries with 20 plus years of experience, I see a similar trend that PNC salaries tend to outpace SOA salaries in the long run. On average, the range of compensation for PNC actuaries was 222 to 552,000, while the range for life, health, and pension was about 171,000 to 475,000. Ezra Penland provides additional views where you can see salary breakdowns by type of employment as well. Looking across these, we can see that consulting and reinsurance roles tend to pay more than other types of employment, with differences being most pronounced for those in the career longer. Another really great resource for actuarial salary information comes from the Actuarial Careers website. They have created a tool that allows you to view compensation across additional cuts of data, such as specialization or credential, region, gender, employer type, years of experience, type of role, such as individual contributor or manager, and much more. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the data does get pretty thin when you slice and dice it across all of these dimensions. So it's tough to say whether these results are truly representative of the entire population of actuaries. Keep this in mind as you use the tool and use caution when you're interpreting these results. As I explored the tool, here are a few observations I had. There appears to be a pretty clear relationship between compensation and the number of exams passed and years of experience. The more of both, the more you will tend to make. The type of role also can make a difference, with compensation increasing when you transition from an individual contributor role to one with supervisory responsibilities. Looking at results by region, it wasn't clear to me that where you work, at least within the United States, made a significant difference in the earning potential. So what are the different considerations uh, for choosing between the SOA and the CAS? Uh, overall, if you are interested in working in PNC area, pursuing is aimed through CAS is probably still the best choice. Uh, you can also go through uh, the SOA and pursue the general insurance track. Uh, I believe when SOA first introduced the general insurance track, they also invited people who have the FCAS to get credit for that track. And the several actuaries have both FSA and FCAS with the exam from both organizations. So I'm not sure if that's still happening, 
but feel free to do your own research if you already have a cast and want to add another letter to your name. Uh, with that said, if you work in Canada and you want uh, to uh, be a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries like myself, currently the CIA does not recognize the SOA general insurance track. Uh, so they accept all the SOA tracks as well as the FCAS or FIA. Uh, so this is something you need to keep in mind. Uh, if you plan to pursue the general insurance track and uh, where would you be working, whether in Canada, US or somewhere else. And if you are unsure about working in PNC insurance um, and want to explore more, uh, SOA will give you more options with different uh, specialized tracks that as I explained in the first video. So going from like investment, corporate finance, uh, enterprise risk management, life, annuities, retirement benefit, group and health. Uh, so personally, I did the uh, corporate finance and ERM uh, track and work in the risk management area. So I can see that many CROs, so chief risk officer in various companies have either FCAS or FSA. So uh, the CRO are employed by various companies from like insurance, reinsurance, consulting to bank. So either option give you a variety of work opportunities. Another consideration is the, the country where you plan to work in. So life insurance industry develop faster in Southeast Asia, like the Vietnam market. Uh, so if you have FSA, you will have more employment options uh, currently, since there are more life insurance players. Uh, on the other hand, it also means that there will be greater opportunities in the general insurance side, uh, that you can be one of the first people uh, there to build things from the ground up in uh, the near future, since the general insurance uh, will eventually catch up. V hit on some great points that are really helpful to consider when you're trying to decide between going the CAS or the SOA route. Based on my research, the earning potential as well as the initial investment isn't materially different between the two societies. I would recommend really thinking about what type of work you want to be doing as an actuary and let that drive your decision of whether to go the CAS or the SOA route. Personally, I love the products that I get to work on, which is auto insurance and homeowners insurance because these are products that intersect many consumers' daily lives. It's exciting and rewarding to get to work on products that can help make people's daily lives better, which certainly can be done on the SOA side, but I personally see it more directly in the PNC space. At the end of the day, I think earning an actuarial credential through either society is a great choice. The skills you learn becoming an actuary can be helpful in many different roles and different places that you could work. If you are still unsure about which paths to choose, uh, try different industry and company if you have internship opportunities uh, from the traditional insurance companies in life or PNC to consulting company to reinsurance uh, to insurance tech or technology companies like uh, uh, Uber or Amazon. If you like this series, don't forget to give us a like. So we hope you understand a bit more about the two choices uh, of uh, SOA versus CAS. Uh, either way, being an actuary is a great, rewarding career choice, uh, no matter which path you choose, and it can open lots of opportunities and advancement uh, opportunities. Uh, so especially if you are interested in insurance or risk or analytics fields. Uh, let us know if you have any comments uh, in the comment section. And if you want to see Chelsea and I collaborate on other topics, uh, let us know as well. And if you are interested in the actual profession or in insurance industry, make sure to subscribe to both Chelsea's and my channels. Uh, again, thank you everyone for watching and we will see you in another video. Bye now.